And if you watched one of my recent videos, then you will know I have a big pile of linen scraps and I was looking for ideas on what to do with my linen scraps. And because I really don't want to get rid of the linen, this is really good linen for embroidering black work embroidery on. Well, one of the ideas that my friends gave me was to make a little pin cushion. But before I just made any random pin cushion out of this linen, I wanted to do some research to find out what pin cushions looked like in history. And here's what I found out. So here's an example of a modern pin cushion. It is the typical tomato that I'm sure many people have seen. But how did pin cushions come into existence? First, a little bit of history. We know that pin cushions have existed in some shape or form since the Middle Ages. They may have also been referred to as pin pillows, pimplos, pin poppets. There are a variety of names for this item. The main object of it is to store pins and needles. Historically, pin cushions were filled with either cotton, wool, horse hair, or sawdust. And depending on how you had the pin cushion, if you were wearing it versus if it was something that sat on the table, if you were, for example, wearing it, the average dimension was approximately two inches in width. Pin cushions in history were usually made from linen, satin, silk, or every once in a while canvas. Just looking at museum examples, both silk and satin seem to be the preferred fabric, at least as far as pin cushions that still exist. Satin and silk were the preferred fabric for the pin cushions. And also historically, many pin cushions were embroidered. And a fun little tidbit, the tomato that you saw on the first page, right here, the tomato really gained popularity during the Victorian era. Here are some examples of pin cushions in history. On the left hand side is a painting from the 18th century. And as you can see, she is wearing her pin cushion. So you have the pin cushion, just a, a small little rectangle that's attached to say a long cord and then that would be attached to her belt. On the right hand side is, on the far right side is a painting and then the picture next to it I have zoomed in. This painting is from 1783 and in the zoomed in picture you can see where she is wearing a pin cushion as well as also wearing scissors. Here are some other examples of pin cushions in history. On the left side is a painting from 1764, and this particular pin cushion is a decorative item sitting on the table. On the right side, well, the middle picture is the full painting, and then on the far right side is the zoomed in left bottom corner of that painting. This painting is from 1740, and in that painting, you can see there is a box sitting next to the dog, and on top of the box is the pin cushion for the pins to stick out of. So, why were pin cushions so important? Because before the Industrial Revolution, pins were expensive because it took time to make them and they were so easy to lose. Just think of how small a typical pin is. Now, depending on what you needed the pin for would then determine the size. Pins were used for everything, especially in women's fashion. You had large pins that would be holding up your farthingale. You could have smaller pins holding up your sleeves. Say you were wearing a partlet. The partlet is in Tudor fashion. You have a square neckline and then you have a partlet that would go over it. That could be for modesty. That could be for just to help keep you warm. But when you're wearing the partlet, usually at the very bottom in the front, you would have a pin to close the partlet because it goes up over your shoulders like a shawl and then pin right here. You could have had pins in your veil. There were pins for many different things to hold up many different parts of your daily ensemble. 
But if you're wearing it, you're using it, you're walking, you're running, you're dancing, you're doing something, chances are sooner or later you are going to lose a pin off of your sleeve, your partlet, your veil, somewhere. And then you have to replace that pin because, well, if anyone has lost a straight pin before, a modern straight pin, you know, they're about one inch long, silver, very easy to lose, especially in carpet. Before the Ancestral Revolution, pins and needles were expensive because it took time to make these items. And so you wanted to hold on to the pins and needles that you had. But just the same, because they were expensive, you wanted to, for example, in the picture on the left side, show off your wealth. We know through the Tudor period, they wanted to show off their wealth, that they had satin or velvet, that they were wearing their furs, their pearls. They had jewels attached to their clothing. They wanted to show off their wealth. Well, for the everyday person, being able to show off your pins, your needles, that was a way to demonstrate the wealth that you had and also be able to keep what you had. Think of it as keeping it under lock and key. That way it was on your person if you were wearing it and you knew exactly where those pins and needles were at all times whenever you needed them. Prior to the 16th century, I haven't found any physical examples in museums of a pincushion prior to the 16th century. I have only found written documentation of pincushions, but the picture on the left here, this is from a painting from about 1480 to 1490. And so on the far left is the full picture. And just next to that, I have zoomed in near her hands. You can see there's a thimble. There are some pins, a needle, what looks like uh, maybe a necklace. And then next to that, it looks like I would describe it as almost like a rolled up piece of paper with a little bit of gold around the center. I could be wrong, but I think this might be something to hold the pins and needles in. On the right hand side are two pictures from the Mary Rose Museum. And these are of bobbins that were found in that wreckage. The warship um, was wrecked in 1545. It was recovered in 1982. These bobbins have a stopper on the side. So if you pull out that stopper, you have a little center cylinder part that you can put your pins and needles in and then put the stopper in to hold your pins and needles in place so you don't lose them. And then further into the 16th century, on the left-hand side is an example of written documentation that I found where a pin pillow existed. In the listings of the New Year's Eve gifts for Queen Elizabeth from 1561 going into 1562, Mrs., if I mispronounce this, I'm sorry, skip with, gave Queen Elizabeth a cushion cloth wrought with black silk and fringed with gold and purple silk with a pin pillow embroidered. Well, pin pillow embroidered to me tells me it's a pin pillow. This is the first example that I have found of a pin pillow existing as a pin pillow of what we can think of being a pin cushion in today's world. On the right side is a picture of a needlework bag and a pin cushion that is presumed to have belonged to Queen Elizabeth I. So the larger drawstring bag is the needlework bag. And then the little one next to it, the little square on the cord, that is the pin cushion. Here's a painting from the very end of the 16th century in 1600. The left-hand side is the full painting on the right hand side is zoomed in to what is on the table. And if you look, you can see pearls, a brooch, but then just above the brooch, there appears to be a large rectangular, I'll describe it as a pin pillow. But you can see there are a whole bunch of pins sticking straight up out of this cushion. And this is a portrait of Elizabeth Vernon, who was the Countess of Southampton. And again, this is from 1600. After this, this is where we go into the 17th century, and then you can find pin pillows, pin cushions, 
much easier throughout different museums. For example, on the left is a pin pillow from somewhere between 1650 and 1699. It is English. It's at the v &A Museum in London. On the right side is another pin pillow from the v &A Museum. This one specifically is 1652. We know because it's embroidered on the pin pillow. And some more examples of pin cushions or pin pillows from the 17th century. On the left-hand side is a pin cushion. I have the one picture shows all of the items that go together, the gloves with the Psalter and the, the pin cushion. And then I have a little red circle around the pin cushion and I've enhanced it on the far left side and rotated it so you can see with this one, instead of having it be a little square or a diamond shape, this one actually reminds me of an hourglass, but it's still attached to a cord that a lady would have worn. On the right side is a pin cushion along with the larger drawstring bag, which is listed as a sweet bag and a knife case. This picture is from the Manchester Art Gallery and it dates to about 1620 to 1650. As you can see, both of these items, you have the fabric, but then there is embroidery on top of the fabric. And again, both are also held by cords that a lady would have worn. Into the 18th century. On the left-hand side is a pincushion from the v &A Museum, and this one is Italian. This one I find interesting just because you can see it's pincushion, and then on the four corners appear to be little tassels. And on the right-hand side is a pin pillow from 1745. This one is at the Met. The main thing to notice, the difference here, is the one on the left does not have a cord or anything attached to it and the one on the right does. So the one on the right may have been something that a lady would have worn, whereas the one on the left would be something that you would have set on your table. And into the 19th century, on the left-hand side is a simple pincushion from the v &A Museum. It is English and it was made in 1835. On the right-hand side is a pincushion. It is at the Met and it was made about 1820. And this one is interesting because it's Huron. By the 19th century, women were either putting their pincushion on the table or maybe on the hearth above the fireplace, but they did not seem to be wearing pincushions nearly as much as they were in the 17th century. If you have questions or would like to see the paintings that were viewed in this video, here is my Works Cited page and more on my Works Cited page. If you have any questions, please post them in the comments below. Remember to select thumbs up if you like the video. And as always, please subscribe to be updated when new videos come out. And please keep an eye out for my upcoming video where I take this piece of linen, put some black work embroidery on it, and make it into a historical pincushion.